One gripe we've heard from so many people is that Islamic mortgages cost so much more than regular mortgages. We've made another video where we explain the technical reasons why that is so. But today's video is all about helping you look in the right places, make the right moves and drastically cut down your eventual outlay by thousands of pounds when you go for an Islamic mortgage. So if you're looking to get an Islamic mortgage from any of the providers you see on the screen right now, here's 14 tips from us to you that will help you get the cheapest possible rates out there. This is going to be somewhat UK focused, but there's going to be a ton of tips that are relevant for overseas audiences as well. Tip number one, take advantage of the lifetime ISA scheme. There used to be a scheme called the help to buy ISA scheme in which for every 200 pounds you put in, the government would contribute 50 pounds, getting you to a maximum government payout of 3000 pounds if you slowly saved yourself up to 12,000 pounds. And if you got your spouse to do it as well, that would have been another 6,000 pounds extra in free money. But sadly, that is not in place anymore. But if you are looking to buy your first house, then you can still open a lifetime ISA instead, which works pretty similarly. The money saved can only be used to buy your first home or save for retirement. Think of it as a savings account. You can put in up to 4,000 pounds each year until you're 50 and the government will add a 25% bonus to your savings up to a maximum of a thousand pounds per year. More details about this scheme can be found in the link in the description below. Tip number two, use the IFG comparison tool. Use our mortgage comparison engine. It's the only Islamic mortgage comparison tool available in the UK market and it is kept fully up to date by our team. The first thing you should screen for is your finance to value or FTV amount, which will depend on how much of a deposit you actually have. Have. The finance to value amount, also known as the loan to value ratio, is the ratio of what you borrow as a mortgage against how much you pay as a deposit. Here's how loan to value ratio works. You pay a deposit of say £20,000 for a property worth £200,000 for example. You get a mortgage of £180,000 to pay for the rest. Your deposit covers 10% of the house price. Therefore, your LTV, your loan to value ratio, is 90%. Thanks for that, Kizer. So if you're buying a £400,000 house and you have an 80k deposit, you can access all the Islamic mortgage products that are 80% finance to value or above and our comparison tool will narrow down what you're eligible for. The other thing to screen for is whether you will opt for a fixed or variable rental rate. Remember, Islamic mortgages usually have a rental rate as the type of contract is different as detailed in our other video by the way. So go and watch that if you haven't already. So a fixed rental rate is where the rate is fixed for two years rather than kept variable and linked to the Bank of England's base rate. It gives you certainty but also means you don't benefit if there are any falls in the rates. Thanks again Khazar. So what you choose will depend in part on your views about where interest rates will go in the coming years but if you think they will go down or stay the same you should probably think about a variable rate package but if you need certainty in your life and to manage cash flows then a fixed rate approach makes much more sense. Extra tip the cheapest bank isn't always the bank that has the lowest headline rental rate. All the other fees and expenses, they add up very quickly. So pay close attention to those as well. Tip number three, keep in mind that you can refinance later. This is an important and oft overlooked point. I personally took out a very long term on my mortgage, 30 plus years. And this is generally advised against by Sharia compliant banks on the basis that you're going to commit to paying a ton more money than you would have done if you only had a term of 10 to 20 years. But my analysis was was that for my circumstances, as I was young, I'll be building up a lump sum to quickly reduce my mortgage in a few years time or even go on to my next house. And so the returns I make from that lump sum will likely be more than the savings I would make by increasing my deposit or reducing the term. And right now I want to have the flexibility of a low monthly payment. I know that's a lot of words. Basically, I wanted to be able to use my money that I save up to invest rather than put that money into my mortgage and reduce the term. Overall, I'll end up paying a bit more over the term of the Islamic mortgage, but only if I actually stay the term out. If I don't and I refinance to a cheaper and shorter term after the fixed rate ends, I'll be roughly in the same position as someone with a much shorter mortgage. Tip number four, use an Islamic mortgage broker. Islamic mortgage brokers are very useful for a few key reasons. Firstly, they will have a much better sense of the overall market than you and I because they deal with the banks day in, day out. So they will be able to more quickly get you a 
good deal and they have that relationship with the banks as well and they can get things through. Secondly, Islamic banks are sadly often overworked and not very customer friendly. And the thing that takes ages is the back and forth in getting the documentation together. And if your broker will be doing that process for the bank, packaging up the entire application, chances are your application process will be a lot smoother. In a nutshell then, I would put my money on a broker doing a better job of quickly getting that mortgage application together rather than the bank's in-house people, someone who doesn't necessarily have as much of an incentive. Islamic mortgage brokers can and do charge for advice at times, but you can also find Islamic mortgage brokers who will just get paid referral fees by the Islamic bank upon a successful completion of a property purchase. You should try to find what broker is obviously the cheapest for you, but also offers you a decent service and where the two things are. Thirdly, halal mortgage brokers do have a personal relationship with the people at the Islamic banks and they can find deals and get things done that otherwise would be very difficult to get things done because Islamic banks do have very strict underwriting guidelines to stick to and exceptions are not going to be made unless you really trust the other person. Fourthly, some Islamic banks actually give better rates if you come through a broker. This is because a broker will have done a lot of the work for them already so they feel like they're saving in costs. So if you're going with Al Ahli in particular, our understanding is that this can actually be cheaper if you go via a mortgage broker. Our partner broker, is called Precept Finance. They're all ex Arayan bank folk and so they have a lot of experience and connections in this space and are very, very knowledgeable about the rates and what's happening. Tip number five, keep an eye on the stamp duty land tax. Make sure you factor in stamp duty into your budget, especially if you're a first time buyer and buying a property worth above £300,000. You will need to pay stamp duty for the value of the property above that price and it can add up into the tens of thousands. I've put a link in the description to the latest SDLT rate bans. And you know what? This can actually be a blessing in disguise as you can use it as a negotiation point if you're buying a house around that 300k mark because sellers will be aware that this will be a sore point for their potential buyers. So if you can get them to nudge the price just below 300,000 because of this and get the house sold for them, that's great. Tip number six, you should always ring up a few of the solicitors that are on the panel of an Islamic bank. They will vary very considerably in price. So make sure you do do that. For a gatehouse and Lahli, you do have the flexibility to choose your own solicitor, but you will have to pay the bank solicitors fees as well. So this is an additional cost if you go with an Ahli or gatehouse. We have used a number of solicitors over the years. In particular, I've used a number of times Icon Law in Birmingham, and we found them to be pretty decent. One useful tip that we got from conducting an in-house survey of our audience was that some savvy shoppers negotiated with their solicitor to bring the cost down. So don't take their first quote for granted and just pay that. It is well worth asking for some movement on the price. Tip number seven, get your home buyer insurance. Now let's say you've got a successful offer in and have instructed your solicitors and started the Islamic mortgage application process. This is the point where you would end up losing significant amounts of money if the deal were to fall through as you will have to pay solicitors, bank fees, etc. Given that a significant number of deals fall through, even at this stage, you should look to protect yourself by taking out home buyer insurance. It will save you thousands of pounds if things don't work out as planned. We learned this the hard way. And yes, before you ask, I personally believe that insurance in many forms is permissible and we have written an article on exactly why linked in the description below. This is, however, my understanding is a minority opinion in the wider Islamic finance ecosystem. Tip number eight, save time by searching efficiently using clever tools. You'll waste an incredible amount of time in your house hunt. You have to narrow down where you're looking, what you're looking for, who the best bank is, calling estate agents, attending viewings, dealing with kids' temper tantrums about which room they're gonna get, and also making sure that your wife's happy with what you're gonna go for. Not easy. Thankfully, there is a company that considerably speeds up that whole process and actually shortlists houses that will be ideal for you. Search Smartly use their proprietary artificial intelligence engine to screen through reams of properties for sale and narrow it down based on your particular requirements that you've told Search Smartly and gets you the perfect house. So rather than going out and searching yourself for thousands of different properties, it will actually throw up the ideal properties that you would perhaps not even ever consider if you hadn't been 
in using the engine. Tip number nine, look for houses that are undervalued or have a motivated seller. Using this Chrome extension that is linked in the description below, you can actually see the historic prices of listed houses on Rightmove. This is pretty useful as estate agents know that a listing that has been on for ages doesn't look very good or sell easily. So they keep refreshing it and creating new listings of the same old property. Now this extension helps you quickly cut through all of that and gives you a detailed price history of the property. Another way to get undervalued properties is look for probate sales. Probate sales are property sales by people who are selling a property on behalf of someone who is deceased. Exactly. So because of this, they are usually motivated sellers and are not interested in keeping the property or getting the absolute last penny of profit out of the property. They want to get rid of it. Tip number 10, ask good questions during home viewing. A home viewing is a research expedition, not just on the house, but also the sellers, the history of the property, the deal, any other nuggets of information that will help improve your negotiation position. Because you see, negotiation is mostly about having all the information you need to make a good offer. But most people rush things or don't ask the right questions. These are the absolute essential questions you should be asking very casually during a viewing. What is the reason for your sale? Where are you moving to? Oh, how long have you lived here? What are the plus points and negative points about this house? Have there been any offers? What were the offers? Are you in a chain? What price are you realistically looking for? How long has the house been on the market? Have you had any building work done? And don't worry, by the way, if you don't get answers to all of these questions, a sensible, savvy seller won't actually answer some of these at all. But it is surprising how often people will answer most, if not all of those questions, and then you're in a stronger position to make an informed offer. And the other really clever thing that you can do is usually in a household when you're being shown around, you might have kids or other members of the family floating around, and you can ask those guys questions as well and get a conversation going with them. And sometimes they can be a lot more amenable with the information and give you that than perhaps the person who's leading the tour of the house. Even though the property market is pretty competitive right now, it's still worth going in armed with good questions that could help in the negotiation process. Tip number 11, move quickly. This is actually a tip for life. Generally, a thing done with momentum achieves better results than one that is left to meander. So move quickly on a property you like, get your Islamic mortgage application in quickly, instruct solicitors quickly, and get the house bought quickly. To give an example, we had an offer for a house accepted before we even had the full deposit together. But the bank we went with were comfortable that within two months, the time it will take for the transaction to complete anyway, we would have had the necessary savings to have the needed deposit amount. So that enabled us to purchase the house quicker and move out a rented accommodation quicker. Tip number 12, look for a house that you can add value to. So look for a house that you can do low cost but high value additions to. For example, an extension can add a lot of value and is relatively cheap, while a swimming pool is very expensive and massively reduces the buyers for the property and actually doesn't add that much value. And where there are changes that are cosmetic and the structural work is minimal, that is where you could be onto a winner. Tip number 13, location, location, location. The crucial thing with location is that you want to find a place that is currently cheap, but for some reason will rise in price soon. So look for major infrastructure projects nearby so that the house appreciates in value over time. For example, check out this incredible crossrail tool that shows you where prices will rise along the crossrail route, which although it's now been built, what you can do is look for similar other development projects that could help you unlock value. A slightly wacky idea, but actually quite a successful one, is look for areas where there's coffee shops on the rise and chicken shops on the decline. Again, house prices will increase in a place like that because what you're seeing is gentrification. You'll be surprised to know that there is hard data that shows that if you invest in areas like this, you will actually make a lot of money. Tip number 14, refinance as soon as your discount period ends. You should look to refinance as soon as the discount period is over and you're switched onto the higher rate of monthly payments. There are other Islamic banks who can potentially help you, especially if you save up during this two to three year discount period, you can potentially even switch over over to a cheaper 65% FTV Islamic mortgage from the likes of other Islamic banks out there, which you perhaps previously couldn't because you didn't have as much of a deposit amount. That's all for today, folks. We hope that was helpful. If it was, let us know in the comments below. If it wasn't, also let us know in the comments below and tell us what we should have added in and can do future videos on to improve this. And don't forget to like, share and subscribe for more content. Until next time, Assalamu Alaikum.